Welcome back. Well, today I thought we would discuss something that came up as a result of a video I did last week. And as a result of that video, there were a lot of people who wrote in and said, I think it's just awful that you're going to take a 200-year-old vase and turn it into a lamp. Well, I am, in fact, taking a vase that is somewhere between 170 and 200 years old and turning it into a lamp. Nothing that was said has changed my mind. And I have some very good reasons for the decision I'm making and a lot of very impressive historical precedents. So I thought today we would discuss when is it okay to restore, repair, refinish, or repurpose old items. So stick around. We'll get to it when we get back. So, how about a little English as she is spoke? And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the book, this is a book that was written by a couple of Portuguese gentlemen who did not, in fact, speak English as she is spoke. In fact, they didn't speak English at all. They didn't even have dictionaries. So, from the section on familiar phrases, Don't he know you? Are you no know for her? You does remember that? You are oldest that me. You sleep too much. You will fall do. You shall catch cold ones. You not know your lesson. You don't dance well. You sing not well. You sing not very deal well. Your guitar is it tuned. You not know anything. You not pronounce well. You take no pain. You don't make that to play. You are a sluggard. You shall be wiped. You not make who to babble. Yours parents does exist yet. I don't know about you, but I do not find any of those phrases particularly familiar. So, let's talk about this. When is it okay or not okay to take an old piece of furniture, repair it, restore it, refinish it, uh, rework it, repurpose it? Well, I have some of my own guidelines, and my own guidelines were not, it was nothing I developed myself. It was, in fact, a set of guidelines that I got from the experts. So let's start with one. When is it not okay to meddle with old anything? And that is when the old thing has historical significance. And in fact, it doesn't have to be an old thing that has historical significance. So I have a pen. I rather like this pen because, as you can see, it's a full-size pen, but when it's capped, it's quite small, fits anywhere. It sits in my desk drawer and rolls around and gets dinged, and it's been there for 20 years, still works very well, perfectly serviceable pen. What is this pen worth? Well, it was uh, a freebie from an advertising agency. It's got their name marked on it. But these are called lanyaps. There's actually a word for that. L-A-I-G-N-I-A-P-P-E, and that can be our word of the day. Lanyap is a little freebie. It's usually given to you by a merchant or a manufacturer as sort of either a free gift upon purchase or just a freebie to advertise their services. So the calendar you get at the bank or from your real estate agent is a lanyap. And it's an interesting word because the word lanyap is actually Spanish, which is why it has a Spanish spelling. And the reason it has a French pronunciation is we got it through the Cajun 
Creole French of Louisiana, which has a lot of Spanish influence. So somebody gives you a little freebie, they have given you a lanyap. And now you can sound very sophisticated. You don't have to say, it was a freebie. You have a better word for it. So it was given away, which means the value is very, very small. And it can sit in my drawer and roll around. But what if this pen had been used by John Kennedy to write his inaugural address? What if this were the first pen that ever wrote, ask not what your country can do for you? What if J.K. Rowling wrote the first chapter of Harry Potter with this pen? What if uh, this was um, uh, one of the, the few worldly goods that Mother Teresa left behind when she died. All of a sudden, this little freebie, no value pen becomes something of historical significance. Do I still get to let it roll around in my desk drawer? Well, I own it, so I suppose I can do what I want. But in terms of my responsibility as a uh, person living on this planet and having in my possession uh, an item of great historical value. No, I really don't. And I shouldn't let it roll around in my desk. I need to do something else with it. And if it needs repair, I'm not the one who should be repairing it. I should turn it over to a professional. And if I cannot afford the services of a professional restorationist, then I should turn it over to someone who can, like a museum. So having said that, that is a category that we are going to set aside historically significant items. And as you can see, they can be brand new or relatively new. They don't have to be a thousand years old. If it has historical significance, don't play around with it. Let someone who knows what they're doing deal with whatever issues need to be addressed. And that's because you wouldn't want the responsibility of accidentally damaging or destroying something that had great cultural significance. Other than that, the simplest rule is if you own it, you can do what you please with it. If it's a thousand years old and it's yours, you can chop it up for kindling. It is your right. So I'm not trying to tell anybody what they can do with their stuff. And I want to make that very clear. If it's yours, it's yours. You do as you please with it. These are my guidelines for how I deal with old stuff. Now, the vast majority of my furniture is over 100 years old. And the vast majority of my furniture, which is to say all but one piece, has been refinished, repaired, restored. Some of them have been utterly gutted and rebuilt. And some of them have been repurposed. Now, when I make that decision, I look at three things. I look at the aesthetics of the piece. I look at the value of the piece, and that's monetary value. And I look at the utility of the piece. Now, if I have a very beautiful, ornate old chair, but you can't sit down in it because the springs are shot, the issue I'm going to be dealing with is utility. It needs to be resprung. And if I can do that without damaging the monetary value or the beauty of the piece, then I'm going to go ahead and do it. Because a chair you can't sit in has no utilitarian value at all. The best you can do is stick it in a corner and let people look at it. And floor space in my house is at a premium. I do not have, you know, some 90-room mansion. If it's going to live in my house, it needs to earn its keep. So utility, that's probably my number one concern. If it can't be useful, I need to fix it. I need to deal with it. If the condition it's in, diminishes its attractiveness. In other words, if the upholstery is torn, if the wood is gouged up, 
um, if there are stains, if there are problems like that, then the aesthetics of the piece is diminished and I need to deal with that. So do I have a problem with that? No. If a piece is broken, a broken piece has very little monetary value. So if it's broken, I'm going to fix it. That's going to increase its value. And of course, it will also increase its utility and hopefully increase its attractiveness, etc. It's all part of the same package. Now, these are not just my rules. So what I want to show you right now is a couple of short film clips. And these are short film clips starring the woman who wrote those rules for me when I was just a little girl. So coming up, a tour of the White House with Mrs. John F. Kennedy. Here we go. Speaking of making things, I understand that you turn one part of this floor into a furniture shop. Is that right? That's true. It used to be the kitchen years and years ago. Then it was a broadcast room under Franklin Roosevelt. President Truman used it to show movies. Now we have an upholstery shop here where we do all our furniture restoring and upholstering. Do you do all of the uh, reupholstering of these old pieces in here? We do mostly. It's much quicker and more practical. So exciting to see things grow every day. And then also in this room, we have three ladies on loan to us from the National Park Service who cure, who catalog every single item in the White House. So we'll be sure nothing is lost track of again. All donors will be given credit in a booklet that everyone can see. This room is really a chamber of horrors now, but I thought it would be interesting for you to see what a room is like when we're starting to do it. Because practically all the furniture in this room we found in storage so battered that there were cries of disbelief when I brought it home. But when this room is finished, you'll see how impressive it will be. This sofa, for instance, was ordered by President Grant, as was this table. And at Grant's cabinet table, there's a drawer for every member of the cabinet. He would lock it up and take the key with him before the next meeting. What about the chairs, Mrs. Kennedy? I mean the chairs around the cabinet table. Those were Grant's ballroom chairs, which were, which were in the White House in different rooms. Then from old engravings, we found that they were also used as Rutherford Hayes dining room chairs. We put them here. That desk is a gift to this room from uh, Mrs. Walter Gartner of South Wellfleet, Mass. It was Grant's wife's desk, Julia Grant. She gave it to us. That's Grant's clock on it. This chair is interesting. It's the one that the Healy portrait of Lincoln in the dining room was painted on. And you recognize it from the portrait? Yes, we recognize it from the picture. This mirror, which is broken in pieces, as you can see, we're going to put in the red room when we get it fixed. It's 1830, Andrew Jackson. So did you see the condition of the furniture? They were, the pieces were stripped right down to the muslin, and that was not even the, the original muslin. The, the muslin, by the way, is that white fabric that, and you could see the nail heads on the backs of the chairs and the sofas because Jackie Kennedy's experts had come in stripped them, gutted them, re, they resprung them, repadded them, put new muslin on, um, they had refinished the wood, they were in fact getting ready to put new fabric on them. And in some cases the fabric was brand new. And if you've actually seen the entirety of that program, you know that also in some cases she had vintage fabric. Um, antique fabric, in fact. Well, it would have been vintage at her time. Um, vintage fabric from uh, Lincoln's era, for example, that was to be put on some chairs that would go into the Lincoln bedroom that presumably nobody would be sitting on because the idea of sitting on antique satin is, well, it doesn't hold up well over time. And I'm also assuming that because that... Um, television special was produced some 60 years ago that many of the pieces we saw have been 
restored or reupholstered again in the intervening years. Now those were pieces of historical significance. Those were pieces of furniture that had belonged to former presidents that had lived in the White House. And no one had any problem taking them apart and putting them back together. The Lincoln chair, as you saw, had to be completely rebuilt. The Jackson mirror, and that was another thing I wanted you to notice, again, rebuilt. Um, it wasn't just a question of they were going to glue the broken pieces back together. They were going to have to reform new ornamentation based on the original ornamentation for that piece. Was this a problem? No, of course not. Absolutely not. It is perfectly acceptable to repair, restore, and renovate old furniture. I do it all the time. The bookcase behind me, believe me, it didn't look like that when I bought it. And it took me a while to end up getting it refinished. In this case, I had to replicate a fumed oak finish. And oak was fumed with ammonia. There is no way, I mean, legally, I could not uh, set up an ammonia fuming um, station. It's, it's no longer permissible. It's too dangerous. And even if I were crazy enough to do that, oh goodness, I, I probably would have poisoned myself. No, I had to find another way to get the same look because I wanted it to have you know, the same look that it had in the 1880s when they were, in fact, doing ammonia fuming. So, I'm not using the same techniques they used when they, they did this. Like I say, legally I can't, and if I could, I would be crazy to do so because it's too ghastly dangerous. When I reupholster furniture, I am not using antique fabrics, not by a long shot, because I'm not going to put a hundred-year-old piece of velvet on a chair that someone's going to sit on. That would be foolish. The velvet couldn't hold up to that, not anymore. So I don't have a problem with this. The reason I don't have a problem with it, frankly, is Jackie didn't have a problem with it. And for my generation, by the way, that pretty much is the final word on the subject. Would Jackie do it? Well, if the answer is yes, we do it. That was just a legacy of my childhood. But the fact is, the people who were doing this work and approving this work were museum curators, antiquarians, historians, designers, uh, it was the cream of the crop. She had people who really knew what they were doing, approving of work like this. And so what's the difference? Well, my skill level, frankly, is not uh, comparable to the skill level of the experts who are restoring White House furniture. But it's definitely good enough for the non-historically significant pieces I'm working with. I'm a pretty darn good upholsterer. I can get the job done. Can I do it up to the standards of the White House? No, I don't think so. And I would never set myself forth as, as that level of an expert. Can I do it well enough? Yes, I can. So let's get into repurposing because that was another one of the complaints. People were saying, well, it's lost its integrity as a vase. It lost its integrity as a lump of clay when someone turned it into a vase, just like the chair sitting across the room from me lost its integrity as a tree when someone turned it into a chair. It's not really a meaningful concept, frankly, uh, because everything, everything has its own integrity. And a vase may have integrity as a vase, but it's going to have integrity as a lamp, too. It's a question of why should one be valued over another. So let's take a quick look at another um, little clip. This is a set of pictures. And what you're about to see is something we see a lot here in South Central Pennsylvania. But it's not so common in other parts of the country.
These are spinning wheel chairs, and they're not the kind of chairs that you sat on when you worked on a spinning wheel. These are chairs that were made from spinning wheels. Uh, most of these chairs were made about 100 years ago, and they were made using spinning wheels that were a good 100 years older at the time as well. And they went from being an item that was no longer useful. I mean, it, if you wanted to spin, it was useful, but we're talking the, the Industrial Revolution, so people no longer needed to spin their own yarn and then weave their own fabric and so on. They could go out and get ready-made fabric. So the spinning wheel lost its utility in the American home. People took the spinning wheels, they turned them into chairs. I think they did a fantastic job. And after you see a few spinning wheel chairs, you're going to get to see something that is in fact mine. And it is Chinese window shades, shutters that have been turned into a cabinet. Now, I did not do this. This was done in China before the piece was brought to the United States for the same reason. Window shutters were used in China right up until the 20th century when glass was commonly used in windows in Chinese homes. The Chinese had a, a surfeit of window shutters that were beautiful hand-carved pieces. Some of them were very, very old. They didn't know what to do with them any longer because they were no longer useful. They were replaced by glass, and they began turning them into other useful items. One of those items is a cabinet that sits in my bedroom next to my bed and serves as my night table. So let's take a look at this. <laughs> As you can see, these are pieces that have been significantly altered, no longer being used for their original purpose. They were altered long ago, and they are now serving a useful purpose. So why is that significant? Because if an item is no longer useful, in the case of the spinning wheels, either they were going to be turned into chairs or they were going to end up getting chopped for kindling. Same thing with the Chinese window shutters. They would have been used for firewood. Summer hadn't said, let's see if we can save them. Let's see if we can repurpose them. And there are a lot of items like this. I personally have a great fondness for tables that are made out of old treadle sewing machine legs. Those are just, they're beautiful. I love them. I, I have I hope, a set of old sewing machine legs out in the schoolhouse that are one day going to support a tabletop. That would be great. So there's a time-honored history in repurposing. When something is not as valuable in one capacity as it is in another, and it doesn't have to be without value, those spinning wheels were probably perfectly usable when they were turned into chairs. It's just that they became more useful as chairs, got a whole new life, and are now prized, as opposed to um, spinning wheels, which may well have ended up in the fireplace or in a landfill. Age, of course, is not a factor either. And we tend to think of age simply because it's, it's a very easy hook to hang your hat on, so to speak. But in Europe, 
in France in particular, there are hundreds of pigsties in the French countryside that were built from old Roman ruins, blocks quarried 2,000 years ago that were used to build aqueducts, to build Roman fortifications, and when they were no longer useful, somebody took them off, turned them into pigsties, or retaining walls, or whatever. Age is not a part of the equation. In this case, once an item is no longer especially useful or desirable, turning it into something else is a time-honored response to that. It gives it new life. It will bring it into the 21st century. So for me, despite the fact that I love the vase that Jocelyn gave me, I would love it because Jocelyn gave it to me if for no other reason, but she gave it to me with the idea that it would be turned into a lamp. That's what she had in mind. It's not for nothing she's the crazy lamp lady. She certainly knows what I'm going to do with it, and I am going to do it. The fact that it is old is not it, it just doesn't enter the equation. It's not old enough to be historically significant based on age alone. It's one of thousands of vases from that period. And it's a beautiful piece. So remember, aesthetics was one of my considerations. It's going to be just as beautiful as a lamp. There's nothing I'm going to do that's going to diminish its beauty it's going to be even more useful because vases, that's a 14-inch tall vase, vases from that period generally weren't even used to hold flowers. They were usually set up on mantelpieces or on cabinets just to be viewed as objects. So the utility is going to be increased and the value financially is going to be increased as well. And that's one, if you don't believe me, go on eBay sometime and start pricing out antique Chinese vases against antique Chinese vases that have been turned into lamps. And notice the value jump once someone has turned it into a lamp. Because a lot of people will buy something they can use uh, for a practical purpose, lighting their room, for example, instead of something that's simply going to have to sit on top of a cabinet because they have no other practical use for it. So there it is in a nutshell. That's why I don't have trouble with this. And as I say, there are things all over my house that are, well, within 20, 30 years of the same age of that vase that I have stripped right down to their bones and rebuilt. And I have no problem with that whatsoever because they were reclaimed. And if they had remained in their original condition, they would have been of no value to anyone. When they are restored, when uh, you can sit in something that had once been a chair but is now uh, oh, who knows what, a doorstop if you can't sit in it. When you bring it back to life, even if it's a different life than it originally had, you're saving it. And I have no problem saving that vase because let's not lose sight of the fact that as a vase, it ended up in a box somewhere gathering dust showing up at a flea market. It's not something that was treasured for its own sake. But it is now and it's going to continue to be because it will be a useful lamp. Now, before we sign off, let me just mention quickly, Kim C., you won the Lucite Bird pin. Please get in touch because we've already established that we have a limit on how long we're going to hold the pieces before we select another winner. And tomorrow, one of the pieces that I gutted right down to its frame and rebuilt
is going to be the subject of our project video, uh, which by the way is why I am in the scruffy clothes, because when I am done with this video, I'm going to start in on that one. So have a great evening, great day, and I will see you all tomorrow.